Hello and welcome to this video about how I built a Kubernetes cluster running on Raspberry Pi 5s. So the reason I started this is on my current engagement for I am a DevOps contractor, the team that I'm working with have been trialing migrating to Kubernetes some AMI based applications and it's been going pretty well. Um, but the one downer that I, I sort of was starting to feel was that my Kubernetes experience was a little bit dated. It was six years ago I was last professionally using Kubernetes. So I decided to go back over the basics. So I signed up for some Udemy courses, but that's so dry. It's so very dry. Um, so I decided to um, build, a, build a Raspberry Pi cluster. So this is just the story of that, basically. Um, in 2019, I had my first attempt at doing so, and you can see that this kind of ice cream sandwich of three Raspberry Pis with the three glowing lights on them. And that was all plugged into a basic Netgear switch, and that was all powered by an extension lead that just so happened to have a bunch of USB sockets on it. And I thought this was marvellous, and this was going to be brilliant. <laughs> Problem, it was an utter slog uh, at that time. I didn't realise... I didn't know much about the, at the time about different architectures and stuff. I was just starting to get into, you know, the kind of I migrated away from dev into DevOps about five or six years before, and I was still finding my feet on a lot of this stuff. And I didn't know that the Pi was an ARM. Um, I thought everything was x86 pretty much. Um, so those are different CPU architectures, different ways the computers work, different instruction sets. And the doctor, Docker containers were assuming x86 architectures. So it took me a while to figure that out, but once I figured that out, I started building my own containers and eventually I got something working. And then I went to bed in a jubilant mood. I was like, brilliant. So I've, I've slayed the Kuba pie dragon as my uh, blog post at the time said. Sadly, I woke up in the morning and it didn't work anymore. So um, <laughs> I, I was starting to get a bad impression of Kubernetes here, unfortunately, which was totally unfair because actually if it was a video game, I was playing on nightmare difficulty. Um, because um, uh, using ARM and all that and using... The, I probably wasn't powering these things correctly. I don't know because I can't go back in time, but I suspect that that four-way extension lead wasn't really giving it the juice it wants. There's a little command you can run to see if the, the Pi is underpowered and it will, it will tell you. Um, if you're running the, the GUI, it will just flash up as well. So... I even wrote a couple of blog posts about the experience and even a song about how I thought Kubernetes was bullying me. <laughs> Tongue in cheek, uh, obviously. Uh, that would be a silly thing to think. Um, but eventually, using it professionally, I did grow to see that it was actually really good tech and that it's really powerful. It allows you to ship very efficiently. And uh, yeah, there's pretty much very little you can't do with it, really. Um, so then, take us up to the current day, trying again, picking up Kubernetes for my current engagement. Um Outside of work, obviously, you've got to do a lot of training, keep your skills fresh. Um, and I love tinkering with the Raspberry Pi. I've got a lot of personal projects. And these days as well, it's a lot easier to do things because AI kind of turbocharges you. And I'm going to talk a bit more about the relationship with AI and dev towards the end of this video. Um, and that's a, a little cartoon still from Akewood, which is my favorite uh, graphic comic. And that's Ray saying, it's been a while since I had a victory of computers. And I, I just love the way these characters are written. The, the, the phraseology. Anyway, um, what could go wrong in 2025? So here's a few apps that I had. Uh, a little app that tells one of my kids bedtime stories. Another app for the same kid about a pink cat that we made together. And it's based on uh, Marie from the Aristocats, who my child thought was called Marianne P for some reason. Um, we made this Monkey Island style game. Um, we've got Norbit Chat, which is our family chat room, which is a, a login list, just works by IP. It's like a little Python chat room with all our custom macros, and it, it's, it's hand coded and it's, it works over um, works over WebSocket. It's just quite good fun, actually. We can do it can do voice chat, and then the Pi Hole, which is you know DNS firewall, which isn't one I've written myself, which is just an application. I thought, yeah, I, c I can stick all that on Kubernetes and tidy all that up, get some redundancy, get some resilience, you know for the massive amount of traffic of my family. Um, so yeah, I figured I'd move these local apps, but I wanted neat and tidy hardware as well. I didn't want cables everywhere. Not my specialty. If you can see over my shoulder where my synthesizers are, there are cables everywhere, I'm afraid. Um, I think my code is a lot neater than my uh, physical world, I'm afraid. I also wanted to do something with those old Raspberry Pi 3s. I'd, uh, just because I'm not using them to host the apps anymore, I want to find some use for them. I don't want to contribute e-waste, so... And also to explore modern Kubernetes, tech moves fast, and in six years, it's a completely different industry to the one I remember. So uh, it changes every day, right? And we, we, I think of it as being like the hobbits running down the river on the barrels. I just want to be the, the or is it the dwarves? I can't remember. Those films are awful. But I, I remember that scene, they're running down the river on the barrels, and I want to be the last dwarf on the barrel um, to 
to borrow that. Uh, still, still going, even though, <laughs> even though the industry keeps changing. So I've got to stay fresh. So first thing I did is I read some tutorials and stuff, and um, I decided on Ubuntu for the operating system rather than Raspberry Pi OS. Unfortunately, I got really obsessed with the fans because <laughs> I'd ordered these Raspberry Pi 5s and I put the cooling systems on the top. I put a, a kind of, not exactly a hat, maybe a pair of shoes, I guess, on the bottom for the SSD. So I had this like sandwich um, and I was like, yeah, okay, well, does this fan work? Because I don't want it to get hot and melt. So I put some load in it. I was like, mm, spin in. Is it really getting fat? And I couldn't manage to drive enough load to kick the fan up. And I, I wasn't convinced that the, the fan was actually responding correctly. And I realised I was just in mad yak shaving territory, just trying to get a flipping fan working. And possibly it was working, but I was like, right, I'm just going to go to Raspberry Pi OS because I know, I know that drives the fans correctly. And uh, I'll leave Ubuntu for now. So I went over to Raspberry Pi OS. I had a few minor issues getting it to boot from SSD. There's a screenshot there. Um, but what I eventually came to is I put the um, headed OS, the one with the you know mouse and keyboard and all that, uh, onto an SSD card. So tricky, SD, SSD. A little little tiny card, put it in, booted it up. And then from there, I used DD to um, get, uh, get the image of the headless operating system and bang that onto the SSD, and then uh, there's something you can change in like the EEPROM or whatever it is, which which allows it to, to boot from the SSD without an SD card. You can also boot from USB. That is an option as well. But um, what would have been really, really nice is if I'd ha been able to provision the SSD from my Mac. Um, so if I'd had something where I could just like a little caddy and just drop that SSD in, that would have meant, because I, I think they can boot from SSD without ever having boot from SD. In theory, I don't know what the default boot sequence is, but um, yeah, so that was fun. I got that up and running. So I've now got booting SSDs until I uh, bungled something and I unplugged an SSD and it went spark and then bang. Obviously these things are very delicate and don't mess around with the ribbon cables. I think there's a reason I'm not, you know, known for my hardware abilities with computers. Um, shame, I had to order a replacement. That's uh, 30 quid or whatever it was down the tube. But then I had the hardware up and running and the fans were behaving and I went through a few tutorials. I chatted back and forth with some AI and I came to the conclusion that this thing K3S, which I'm going to call Kez, um, would be a good thing to use. Now, it's a, Kez is a lightweight distribution of Kubernetes. It's designed for edge or resource constrained environments, it's basically lightweight, not a lot running there, single binary, not much overhead. It hasn't got everything that comes in your default. Kubernetes package. So um, it hasn't got cloud or storage drivers. Um, you, you use external CSI drivers for writing your files and all that to disk. Uh, it hasn't got audit logs, much simpler logs, nothing alphas turned on. It's just stable. Uh, there's no Docker shim. I mean, there rarely is in modern Kubernetes, I guess, but container D is running. Uh, simple network based on flannel. Um, and no built-in etcd so etcd is like the uh, the value store the, the distributed value store it just uses a very simple sql like database and there's no cube proxy there is a kind of built-in service lead balancer in some modes but yeah it's it's really stripped back um the only problem with that is sometimes you're expecting one of these features to be there if you read just about kubernetes at large and then you realize it's not uh, I found this uh, tutorial for actually install installing it. It was a couple of one-liners. It was really, really straightforward, but um, it's just good to have a, someone else who's been there and done it before, don't want to reinvent the wheel. And I soon had a two-node Kubernetes cluster. The thing with tutorials, though, is there are a point in time and the operating system or the hardware or the software has always moved on from where the tutorial was written. It's like a snapshot. At this point in time, this worked. So, yeah, you, 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 it's it's good fortune if a, if a tutorial just works and this one did for me at this time no guarantee it would work for you at your time because you can only be in the future anyway i started to port the apps across and as soon as i started i realized i needed a load balancer so i installed metal lb and that allows me to connect an ip address on my network to um, a service in Kubernetes. Uh, if, if a service has exposed something then it can link all that up which is really nice because uh, so my network, I've got like 192.168.1.100 and above. It's assigned by the router. So anything below that, except for dot one, which is my, you know, the, the the router itself, I could I could allow Metal LB to assign those. So um, I've got some some um, some of my uh, YAML manifests for Kubernetes which tell Metal LB what hosts on what IP, and then that provisions enter PyHole to tell PyHole 
what goes where. So that was quite nice. So yeah, um, I needed each app to be containerized though. Uh, Pi-hole already had a container option available, or you had a Helm chart, and Helm is like um, it, it, it's like roided up manifests basically. <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible butchering, but uh, Helm allows you to manage things with a simple values file, and then you've got like the the, the Helm chart which knows how to install it. It's, it's all very, very clever. <laughs> Um, so I containerized my bespoke apps and I did this through a simple AI workflow. Just say, Hey, write me a Docker file. Off it went, pushed to a GHCR, which GitHub's, um, like Docker repo, a private repo, and then got the AI to create me a manifest or a Helm chart as appropriate. Um, if it's just a simple manifest, it's just a simple Kubernetes native YAML thing, just tells Kubernetes what to do. And the apps are shown in the background for, for the apps in the lower left, there's a Sonic game. I made one of my children when. That child was about four. Uh, then there's Norbit Chat, which is our family chat room. There's Story App and Marianne P in the World So Pink, which is made in Visionaire Studio. It's point and click adventure. And uh, yeah, it's just all good fun. So those were all eventually containerized, put on Kubernetes. Norbit Chat is a bit more involved. I needed to go a bit beyond the very basic AI based workflow for that because it's got certificates uh, and so over HTTPS. It's got state, so it needs to read and write files. And um, yeah, it's just a bit a bit more heavyweight. It, it's got sockets and various ports open. And yeah, it's a bit, a bit more going on. And there's the script that stands it all up. So the first thing it's doing is is installing local path provisioner uh, ranchers offering, then Metal LB, and then uh, I'm installing some Kubernetes dashboard tools just to you know have a have a browser based visualization into the tool. Although um, is it K9s or, or I can't remember which, which way around the nines and the s's are, but um, that that's a nice CLI based tool. But there's a lot of these visualization tools, and then I've installed installed the Norbert chat secret, and then I've applied my manifests, and then I've just used one Helm chart at the bottom for um, for uh, the pie hole, and I've got a values file, which is my configuration. It's got all these services IPs to tell Metal LB what to put where. And then it's pushed it to GitHub. It's a private repo because it's got my kids' names in it and stuff like that. So, but um, yeah, it's all, all up and running and working. Um, so on, back to the hardware. This is what it, it was looking like. So. From left to right, you've got two Raspberry Pi 3s and then two 4s. Um, they're powered by these Ethernet PoE splitters, power over Ethernet splitters, because I bought that switch, that Netgear switch, which can actually push not only network, but power along the same cable. Um, natively, the Pi doesn't support that, so you can use a splitter, so the power goes in and then cable comes out. But those cables are simultaneously both too, la too long and too short. <laughs> <laughs> so they're, like, they're in the way, um, but they're also like, it's really hard to get it in, in, in the socket. And yeah, I wasn't keen on that. They take up a lot of space and they run quite hot. So in a pinch, yeah, really useful, but I didn't want to run it long term. Uh, so here's what I ended up with. So my network switch is powering three pies at the moment. The fourth pie is just redundant in the rack. It's just there for if, uh, if I ever want it. Uh, the PoE injector is going to one of the Pi 5s, which has a cooler on top and the Pine board, the original Pine board underneath with the SSD. The second Pi, I got a Geek a Pi P33 MVME MKE PoE hat, which came with a cooler as well. So I ended up with an extra cooler. Um, and that goes on top and, and I don't need the Pi board underneath and it does PoE and it, ju it just does it all in one. It's quite a good price as well. So there's a much neater solution. I'll show a picture of that in a moment. And then finally, the Raspberry Pi 3 still running off SD card. I didn't really see the point in uh, SSDizing that at this time. But it's got a simple WaveShare PoE hat and cooler on, and that, that works happily. And I bought some shorter network cables. I was really pushing my luck. Those are six-inch cables and barely bend them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so the, the Pi 3 has the blue cable, and then... The one with the new hat, the Pi 5 with the new hat, has the yellow cable. And I'm still using one of the PoE splitters because I'd spent enough money, quite frankly, at this point. So here's the bill of materials. I know that my stupid face is in the top right corner, but I'm not going to pull things around in OBS while I'm while I'm recording. Uh, I'm compositing this in OBS. It's just a screen share from uh, Google Sheet, uh, Google slides so yeah it cost me just under 600 quid some of that was i could have done better i think but um i'll talk about that in a second but the main lessons i've learned is that kubernetes on pi is fine now you know it's really fine um and i said i was going to talk a little about ai so i, I have a lot longer uh, vastly longer thoughts on ai and, and more detail about how it changes what we do as software people away from being wizards that do these incantations towards being orators towards being people who explain things 
uh, and then understand the solutions. So we've got to straddle those words, worlds. We still need to understand what the AI is outputting. We can't just blindly trust it because half the time data sets a year old or, or whatever, or, or it just hallucinates it. So it's just like working with a teammate who's both very bright and very smart at the same time, um, but also very dumb at the same time. You know, it's, its intelligence seems to vary a lot. Um, but doing hardware gives me the satisfaction that I used to feel from the wizard side of my job, of the wizard side of um, solving hard problems in, 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 in a way that most people don't even have the frame of reference for. That's what I mean by feeling like a wizard. Um, not that I'm endorsing magic, because you know, <laughs> no way. Um, but yeah, uh, but being like an orator is like, okay, explaining what we need to accomplish, explaining it as clearly as possible, uh, 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 unambiguously. So that's the, that's the skill. Uh, but the hardware, bolting that together, that still feels like, that still gives you that buzz of, oh, I'm solving problems. So that's great. And there's a picture of my little workbench there. What I would do differently, I wouldn't have wasted money. <laughs> I ended up with some spare gear. And I would have used the all-in-one uh, power over Ethernet and SSDs hats all along rather than separate components because it's just neater. It sits neater in the, in the little case. I wouldn't have blown up the SSD. That was a stupid thing to do. I should have turned it off first. And... I want to improve how I collaborate with AI. I want to um, tighten the loop. Um, uh, I think, you know, IDE integration and things like that, I'm, I'm mostly still going through the browser, but I think tightening that up is is going to help. But um, I'm, yeah, I, I've got a lot more to say about that. So what's next? I'd like to build a little domain forwarding service because I've got some stuff blocked on my pie hole, but I've got equivalents. The so like certain domains like Twitter is blocked or X is blocked, but Knitter is is not. So to transparently forward onto that, like if someone sends me a Twitter link, so I can at least read it. Um, I want to try the Talos Linux distribution. Uh, it's been recommended to me as something that's quite good for this kind of stuff. But ba basically, I just want to keep sharpening my Kubernetes skills. Like none of us can stand still. Um, I want to do some GitOps stuff, which is like when Git becomes the source of record, the source of truth for a system. And then any change in there is automatically deployed. So I like the sound of that. I've done GitHub stuff before, but not specifically done a lot of it in Kubernetes. Um, maybe tie together that provisioning script's a bit basic in it. And that Raspberry Pi 3, well, that could be the controller uh, of the cluster. So um, it doesn't need to be, but I don't need it at the moment. The cluster's running perfectly with just the two Raspberry Pi 5. So I don't really burn power for the sake of it. So thank you if you've made it this far. This is my first video on GavinDavisLimited.com. I'm looking to put together a lot more of this kind of stuff, largely as a way to push myself as a professional and to keep myself sharp, to improve myself as a communicator. Um, so yeah, I really hope you found some of that interesting. We'll be back.